Hello everybody and we're really, really excited to welcome you to our In Focus webinar today, BU and School Age Care. I'm, really, I'm Sarah Richardson, I'm a BU Early Childhood Australia State Manager uh, based in Adelaide where it's a bit wintry and cold today and I'd like to introduce our panellist Jeremy Tucker from Headspace. So Jeremy, you want to say hi to everyone? Morning team. Uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, you, go. you go. Well, I'll give myself a full introduction, hey, why not? Um, yep. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the education consultants with the Headspace Schools team um, and I'm working here in sunny Western Australia. It's a little bit cloudy at the moment. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. And I'd like to also introduce Brooke. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brooke Capavilla. I've been working in um, education and care service um, industry for the last 25 years. 20 years of that time has been in local government children's services. And for the last two and a half years, I've been working at a community based not for profit um, butch service in Castle Hill, Sydney. I'm also the um, action team leader for the BU program. I'm ex delighted to be asked to share some of our journey so far today with you. Thanks so much, Jeremy and Brooke. Um, and we'll, um, they'll pop off screen now, but we'll um, come back to them in a minute after we've done some of the introductions. And, and hopefully you can all join with us to have a really great chat about what BU might look like in a school age care context. But just a little back, bit of background. For those of you who don't know, BU is a national initiative. It's led by Beyond Blue in partnership with Early Childhood Australia, who I'm, um, who I work with, and also Headspace, who you heard from Jeremy, where he's from, and it's funded from the, by the Australian government. The vision for BU is that each learning community, and when we say a learning community, we're looking at school age care or early learning or a school, is positive, inclusive and resilient a place where every child, every young person, every educator and their family can achieve their best possible mental health. It's really aspirational, but it's really exciting to be part of something that's really looking to change a gen and create a mentally healthy generation. If you are registered for BU, you will already know a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today and be great for you to share some of your experiences if you can. Um, and also this might give you an opportunity to think more and think a bit differently about what you might add to, to be your BU. If you're not registered and you'd like to, this might be an opportunity or a starting point for you to start thinking about how you might do that. Um, as part of the BU initiative, we have an, and also as part of Early Childhood Australia's Reconciliation Action Plan, we um, are continue to learn and be inspired by an ongoing process of embracing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander approaches and perspectives in our work, the ways of knowing, doing and being, and we focus on them to, to make mental health matters. So I'd like to um, now acknowledge that I'm meeting with you in the land of, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm meeting with you on today, the land of the Ghana people um, of the Adelaide Plains region and pay respect to, to elders past, present and emerging. And you might like to acknowledge the lands that you're meeting on from today as well. Um, we also, today, as we go through today, what I'd really like you also to think about is how you can um, be informed by our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives in all of the work that you do. The other thing that we really need to do when we're having this conversation about mental health is to think about how we're going to take care of ourselves and each other. The slides, this slide shows some of our, um, our BU symbols for self-care. Um, so making safe and also learning many ways. And these symbols are informed and part of the Always BU resources in the, on the BU um, website. And you'll find them there if you have a look around. I think it's really important that, as I said, as we have this conversation, we think about taking care of ourselves. Um, and if you're any time you need support, um, please reach out either in the chat or your through your own um, through your own in your own context as well. Remembering talking about it and looking for help are really important, but also taking care of each other and remembering to be respectful that people have different opinions and ways of viewing things and ways of seeing things and different ideas. So just reminding you that taking care, self-care is about taking care of yourself and each other. 
as we're in this space today, it's really also just to help you out a little bit, this is the online space we're, we're in. So I'm sure that over the last few months, you will have been in a number of different spaces. We're using a, a go-to webinar platform. Um, and so this might not be so familiar to you. If you've been to one of our webinars before, you will know. So there is a question and answer function. And I'd really like to say, um, Hi, and a shout out to people working behind the scenes today from our Early Childhood Australia team. So Dino and Steph, but also uh, Emma and Sammy, who will be responding to some of your chat questions and um, and pushing, um, sharing some of your responses with everybody and with us. Also like to thank Maria, who's also um, adding some content into the, the chat box to give you some ideas and some additional resources and support own support for um, thinking differently, perhaps some reflective questions and those kind of things as well. There is a handout that you will see as well that you can access um, and remember that all of these things will be available post webinar. So if you don't get to do that today and you just want to listen and participate that way, then um, that's fine as well and maybe you can access the handouts and other resources later on. We'll also be having po uh, some polls. So this is an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, so as a poll comes up, we'll just it'll be on screen and you'll be, you'll be asked to respond. So please feel free to do that as well. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas in any of these spaces in our online space. So let's get back to the conversation that we're going to have today and we welcome back um, Brooke and Jeremy. The focus for today is, um, as I said, on school aged care. And I just do want to say that we this is a national initiative. And so we've had a lot of conversations about how we describe the school aged care um, space. And I know that each of you, and, and Brooke's already mentioned that, will use different ways of describing that. Um, we're going with school aged care just as a way of covering um, everybody. But I just want to acknowledge that you may well refer to yourselves perhaps as Ush or Osh or um, other other things as well and you know I really want to just say that whatever we just however we talk about it we we hopeful you feel like we're talking about about you and what what works for you I guess the other conversation we want to have today is how can we how does a conversation about mental health and well-being fit into your context what does it look like and we're going to look at the how we're going to also going to look about what that looks like for those children that you work with from probably about four to right through to 14 at 14 13 maybe um maybe 14 um where it might fit how it might fit and also the why and i think that's a really important um thing to consider so we'll look at that in a range of different ways and we'll, we'll have a conversation really with each other about what that looks like. You also might know we're talking about mental health, but you might know that as social emotional learning or you might refer to it as wellbeing. So one of the things we want to do today is make a connection between that. So if we think about that, um, that question, is there a place for mental health and wellbeing in, in the school aged care context? Brooke, from a service perspective, how would you respond to that kind of question? Yeah, I definitely res response would be that mental health and wellbeing is crucial in out of school hours care centres. Um, as children are progressing through infants and then the primary school years, um, they're faced with new challenges, whether it be developing or maintaining friendships, um, the academic and sporting achievement, you know, children not getting into particular groups at school can be disheartening for them. Their personal development as they, you know, particularly years five and six, and they become more conscious of those areas, which obviously can impact on their wellbeing. I also feel that children um, are starting to develop a stronger sense of the mental health and wellbeing of family members and the friends around them. Um, and I, in regardless of out of school hours, care services know some children come for 15 minutes, some are there every day getting picked up at six o'clock at night, and they all need to have that. Um, sense of true belonging and acceptance from the service as a whole and also from the educators. Um, that's obviously why collaboration between children and the educators and the family is so important. Thanks Brooke. And Jeremy, from your perspective, is there a place for mental health and wellbeing in school age care? Definitely. I think um, a huge part of my work and the work that I do with the Headspace Schools team and through the BU initiative is supporting best practice mental health and well-being and, and from a whole school approach. Um, and from what I find is, you know, every school does mental health and well-being 
in some sort of way. Um, because everyone is, you know, every school is a microcosm of their own world. And when I think about what that looks broad, you know, in a broader sense for school age care, um, you know, I, from my experience, many school age cares, and it, including the one that, you know, my, my little young people go to, my, my three kids, um, they're attached to the school. Um, so for me, it is a, you know, they're the first people that they see in the morning. Um, and the last people that they see in the afternoon for the days that they attend. Um, and they're a huge extension of the school and the community. And I think even in a broader sense for school age care, um, you know, many of them are attached to a school, sit next to a school, um, have a very close relationship with the school coming to and from, um, as well as that broader, broader community. And you, even, even if you think in sort of a broth and Brenner model about the people that support our our children and our young people, you've got your young person at the centre and you've got your family and their community and their school that sort of sit around that, but then you've also got your all the other services that that young person comes in contact. Um, and even just touching on some of the things that, you know, Brooke sort of touched on, um, when we're thinking about mental health and wellbeing, you know, and, you know, as you said, Sarah, the different languages that we use for that, um, you know, it's lots and lots of different things. It's It's social and emotional learning, um, for a number of school age cares, we might even be thinking about, um, even when we talk about something like behaviour, for instance, and you know some of the things that we might be doing to support a young person before and after school or in the time that we see them, we know that behaviour and mental health are often the flip sides of the same coin um, because you know what might be coming up for you know for that child or young person, um, they might be verbalising that, they might be acting out in certain different ways or, you know, not not acting their normal sense. And I say normal because everybody's normal is totally different. Um, so there's, you know, it becomes an integral part of the way that we work and we already work. And I think um, one sort of reflection I had uh, when we were chatting, Sarah, was, you know, every every you know school age care already does this you know in so many different ways um, and that's why today we can sort of focus on about what that sort of looks like and what are some of the things that we can do to really hone that in and have a bit of a focus on that um, or really you know um, have a bit of a strategy to it so definitely has a place. Yeah. Thanks Jeremy it's interesting to say that too because um, for me one of the things coming into this coming from an education background um, is you know I really came to understand that you know, we hear that word mental health and we think it's something about, you know, over here, but actually it is the core of our work. And when what we would describe it in an education setting probably is, you know, social emotional learning or wellbeing or, you know, those kind of things. Um, but actually good practice is supportive of mental health and it's really the same thing. And I agree with you and, you know, it is what we're doing already. We just haven't ever called it or referred to it as, as supporting mental health. And I think the other point about that too is that when when we talk about mental health, we talk about the the breadth of mental health. So good mental health is part of that whole picture. And when we have mm. mental health concerns or, you know, when a child might be needing some additional support because there's some, you know, some perhaps some um, diagnosed mental illness or something, um, then, you know, we're talking about all of those things and how we might, um, explore that a bit more. Have I used the right language, Jeremy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think. You, <laughs> yeah, so, and the, you know, I think that's part of what this with this journey is about is is learning about that and and exploring that and you, starting to use that language. We talked about that last time, Brooke, didn't we? When we, you know, mm -hmm. have we started using that language? Are we still sitting in our comfortable social emotional learning or well being language? Yeah, and I think this is the most important thing, and I think this is a huge. Um, thing that I've taken from the work that I do with schools and with educators is we we really want to acknowledge that mental health and well-being or you know mental health literacy is in our first language when we're speaking to educators um, yeah. and you think about the amount of people that are working in school age care you've got full-time staff you've got casual staff you've got people who've been working in the industry for a long time or people who sort of um, ebb and flow out of it um, everyone who works in school age care or works in care, they, you know, they obviously you know, they have care in their role. And, you know, it's, we all, we all in that sort of industry because we, you know, we do care about our children and our young people, um, you know, and even with myself, you know, I've worked with, um, you know, I, at the moment, I probably look after just over 200 schools here in WA and um, supporting, you know, um, mental health and wellbeing from an educator's perspective. And you know the mental health literacy of every single educator is totally different, and that's because we bring our own lived experience. Um, we might have that from our experience within families, the schools that we work in, the communities that we live in. Um, 
but everyone's understanding of that might be slightly different. And as you said, the language is, can be totally different. You know, language by definition is a construct. We might call it something totally different, um, you know, and we have different understandings of what that is. Um, but even simply, if we just think about mental health that sits on a continuum and sometimes we're good and sometimes we're bad and we sort of go between that daily, weekly, monthly, sometimes it's week one, we, we're really good. And then week 10, we're not really good. Um, yeah. And just really, you know, having that understanding and that and that knowledge. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that I love about the BU framework as well is um, just giving people that sort of common knowledge and that common language to be able to talk about what that looks like for them as, a, as you know, as an individual and the teams that they work in and in the services and schools that they work in as well. Yeah, I think that leads really nicely into the poll. So we might jump into the poll um, now because it would be great to hear from you about how you see yourself and whether having more mental health awareness um, support in the would that support the work you do so I guess that's really with the conversation we've just been having is you know it does learning more about what mental health actually mean or building our mental health literacy as Jeremy described it would that support you in your work so if you want to select one of those and if you're not sure that's all that's fine too um, the other and you also talked Jeremy about language and I guess that's the other thing to just to um, be mindful of is that we might refer to you know different people will describe their um, school age care program with different in different ways so um, you might describe it as a place an opportunity for children to develop life skills or a recreational program or a leisure program um, and all of those things are you know unique to your context but all of those things also feed into a, to the social emotional learning and well-being of children and to their mental health so we might close the poll, Maria, and have a look and see what people have said. So overwhelmingly, yes, um, which is great. So, and you know, I guess that's why you've chosen to come is because you are interested in this and you think it's something that might be helpful and supportive in, in the work you do. And hopefully as we go in, it'll give you, we'll have more opportunity to explore what that looks like in a bit more detail. Um, and some people are not sure, which I think is really important too. And maybe that's why you came too, because you're thinking maybe it might help me. Um, and I think perhaps now, and we didn't talk about this the other day when we were having conversation, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that this work we're talking about and the BU framework is not therapeutic work. Um, and I'll just maybe, and I'll throw to you, and this is a question without notice, Jeremy, but you know, that whole notion that this is not, this this is within the realm of our work that we currently do. And you, I think you touched on that a bit before. This is the work mm. we do. And this is not about being a mental health expert. This is about supporting children's mental health and wellbeing in the, in the frame or the, con, con, you know, the limitations of your role. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, when you think about, for me, when I think about the BU framework, um, it's made for schools to be able, you know, schools and services and, you know, to be able to use and utilise how they want and how they need. And I think what you were touching on, Sarah, is, you know, wellbeing and mental health is a huge space within schools and it's really hard to figure out where to start um, or w how to keep going and what to do. And, you know, because there is so much work that you can consistently do in this area without seeing quick results. You know, we know that mental health and well-being, it's, a, it's an ongoing approach. It's a circular model, you know, with, with the, you know, um, what's going to be happening. So, you know, that point that you said before about, um, you know, we're not all going to be pseudo counsellors for every student, young person that we see. Absolutely not. Um, but specifically, you know, even if I think about the BU sort of early support model, um, there's a really good uh, model in there that's called the NIP model. So it's notice, inquire and provide. Um, and it's really about getting our young people to the best support that we possibly can as quickly as we can. Sounds really simple, but it can be really tricky for a child or a young person if we know that they're struggling. And really it's about increasing two things. It's confidence and competence. So it's about us as, you know, as educators, as people working in a service, as people who have young people and children in, within our lives that we, you know, see and interact with. It's being about being able to about you know being able to notice some of the things that are going on for that young person, some of those changes in their normal day to day life, some signs, some symptoms, um, and getting them to support. And as you said, that doesn't make us pseudo counsellors, but it does make you know it has a bit of onus to say, you know, we can do a lot of great work in this. Us as in as every individual, 
um, you know, can have a bit of literacy around that, have, can have a bit of understanding to, you know, increase that confidence and confidence and then figure out within our services, our schools and all the places that we work about what sort of processes and procedures we have around that. And that can be a really good onus about um, some work that you can do in that area. Yeah, and I guess, Brooke, that leads into, you know, you were already been using the BU framework um, within your context. Do you want to tr just talk a little bit about how, how it's look, what it looks like in your, at your place? Yeah, certainly, Sarah. I totally agree with what Jeremy's just saying. I think that wrapped that up for me, um, that, yeah, we don't expect, well, we haven't had that expectation of our educators to be experts in mental health and wellbeing. I'm the action team leader, but I'm far from that. I'm just passionate about um, implementing the program within the service. And we've already been doing so much. Um, so for a lot of service, I'm sure when you sit back and create your action team, you'll actually see or discover all the things that you were already doing um, that you can extend on or things that you can implement new for your service and making that a true reflection of what's happening ideas that I might talk about today or the paddle might talk about is obviously not going to be, there's no copy and paste model um, to take. You need to make it reflective of your educators, your, um, your children and obviously the whole community. Um, but we, yeah, as a starting point, we've all, if, whilst we have an action team, um, we've always consulted with all our staff um, through meetings or emails, we've kept communication to everybody. So it's not just limited or driven by um, the action team, everyone's consulted. Um, but through our early stages of our consultation with our educators and children, there were some new things that we were able to implement straight away. Um, that looking at each age group and sitting back and realising what perhaps, you know, if they're not engaged in an activity, it doesn't necessarily mean that we aren't programming to meet their needs. We've got to look at things differently. Um, a good example of this was last year that we had um, some year six children, mainly towards the end of the year when they're getting ready to move on. A lot of them had been with us for since kindergarten and they would just lay on the, on the grass up at the oval or on the tennis court and they would just be chatting and looking up at the sky. Um, and when we spoke with them, it was just about having a space where they could have that, where it didn't have to be that they were running around the playground or they were busily engaged in a craft activity, that for them, um, fun at Oosh was just being able to have their own space. So we purchased little um, shade, stru stru shade structures from Kmart, really cheap and easy to pop up and move around um, in our outdoor space. We also implemented um, year group leaders last year. Because we're a large service catering up, catering for up to around 140 children, we felt there was a need to allocate year group leaders. So we were, um, like Jeremy said, sometimes we're just looking at those children that are displaying obvious behaviour issues or we're aware of some circumstances at home that might be impacting on the child. We th thought, we thought through um, having year group leaders that would be able to um, ensure that all children are looked at regardless um, of what's going on in their lives or standing out to us because sometimes those little things go under the radar and those children often their parents come in and out quickly and you find it very difficult to have um, chats with them. Um, we've also an objective last year for the service was to bring more music into the service. We felt that wasn't happening enough. Whilst there's enough noise happening with that many children in an indoor space, um, there's times in before school care when we open up and that walking into an environment with some nice relaxing music or some music that they can bop to around, that's really important as well. But um, so we've been conscious of that. And through some um, behaviour, challenging behaviour we had with some children um, that didn't want to come outdoors and they didn't really um, stay engaged in that activity for a long time. Observing those children, we found that perhaps it was the train set or construction that they really enjoy when they're outside. So we've gone from just having the colouring um, box outside and opened our mind to say, why can't the train set come outside? Why can't the building blocks come outside? Because the um, relationships and conversation that's created with other children has really um, yeah, made the time for many children after school um, a happier place for them. Thanks, Brooke. Um, I guess that kind of really moves us into that next co question that we were wanting to think about. What do, what 
does it look like, sound like and feel like for children when you have implemented or you are implementing BU? And I, and I really important that I change that because I don't think you ever fully have finished implementing BU. I think, um, Sorry, Steph, I did skip ahead and I jumped ahead a question, but let, let's do this one first and then we'll go and come to that next one. Um, so the question here is how might BU help you? And I guess it still follows on from what you were talking about too, because I think school aged care settings have this unique opportunity to, as you started describing, and I think Jeremy, you alluded to it too, that there is a unique opportunity because it's got a recreational or a leisure or life skills focus. It's not just focusing on the educational skills or ed, you know content stuff. We got we've got there's opportunity in the school aged care space to to explore this whole co concept of mental health. So, um, do you want to add any more to that, Brooke? You know, following on from what you've been talking about. No, I think that's it, Sarah. Jeremy, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think when you think about, you know, BU supporting um, services, I think Brooks touched on some really awesome points there. I know for myself as a parent, um, you know, when I think about my three kids, when they, I pick them up from school and come home, um, you know, almost we have to get into battle stations to figure out how they de-stress from their day. Um, I think about my eldest who loves to, you know, he just loves to have his space and his time and he, he loves his quiet. Um, but my middle child who, you know, she's in kindergarten now and she's a strong independent woman. Um, she loves to, you know, she loves to run her, run her energy off and that's how sort of she de-stresses as well. And I think, you know, Brooke's examples about, you know, having a look at um, what, you know, what our children and young people are wanting and needing has a, you know, has a real um, real value in every service and every, you know, school age care about, you know, what are some of the strategies that we need? And I think, you know, I touched on it before, but B is really, really there as a framework to put a bit of scaffolding around how we do mental health and wellbeing and have a bit of a focus for it. Because as I said, every service will be doing it, but sometimes it might be a little bit ad hoc, you know, so we might have some awareness raising here. We might have um, a couple of programs or, you know, some things that are suggested from, staff or students or all that sort of stuff as well but it really gives a bit of scaffolding around you know ways that we can focus on and for me it's really about one celebrating what are we doing really really well and then thinking about what are some opportunities that we want to improve and for me a lot of this you know within the BU framework there's lots of planning and implementation tools to sort of celebrate that as well one thing that I, I really love and um, I've found that um, working with schools that have school age care attached and working really closely, um, there's a tool called the Actions Catalog, which is really cool because you can actually go through and um, it's a PDF document and it has in, in rows, um, you know, what are some of the domains and what is, what is um, you know, and what, what are some of the actions that we can do to support mental health and wellbeing in that space. And I can think of a specific example where um, there was a school aged care sitting inside of a primary school and um, it was an OSH club and the OSH club had mass, you know, they had great um, connections with the families because they were the ones that actually had that interaction with family. Um, they had about six or seven workers um, that could, you know, when mum and dad dropped, you know, child or young person off, they were able to have a have that, you know, that quick little informal conversation. Um, whereas, you know, within um, when we're thinking about the school context, there was one teacher and 30 students that had really good connections with the family, for instance. Um, and what they did was they looked at all the things on the actions catalog that they were doing really well with the families and how that sort of worked for them. And then they met with the school about what are some of the things that we're doing really well and how can we sort of how what how can we sort of merge those two together um and then looking at some of you know their strategies and what they wanted to do they used that you know that section of family support and how they really celebrate a family um and all the amazing stuff that they did and they really really celebrated that and then they talked with the school about what are they what are they sort of seeing and what they did was through a, you know a couple of meetings and some interactions with the staff was figuring out where they wanted to go. And for that particular school, it was about getting students to early support. So it was about getting young people um, that weren't doing so well to, as we said, the best support that we possibly can. And they came up with some internal strategies about how they communicate that with family at school and all that sort of stuff as well. 
so for me when I look at that question you know BU as we said it's really supporting mental health and well-being in that whole school approach but in two really simple ways from every service we can do that you know really simply is celebrate what we do really really well and then the next step is to look at okay what do we want to focus on and how do we want to improve and what are some of the tools and resources that we can do that and that's where BU sort of comes in for me anyway. Yeah it, so. it's interesting that's a great example Jeremy and I, I think one of the things and I didn't mention it before but BU is a birth to um, 18 um, framework and and I think and we talk, were talking about language before and and you know not all school age care services have the um, opportunity of having that really close relationship with the school um, and you know it's great if, if that is the is the option uh, or you know is the reality but it's not always what this potentially could do is if the school was using a BU framework and the school and the school aged care service was as well it would give you a bit of a shared language to have some of those conversations and so it could be one of those opportunities that might be able to bring you together in ways that you haven't been able to do that before you know obviously there's a whole lot of other things going on there and really want to acknowledge the reality of that because I know for some for some school aged care services that isn't the, their experience and they don't have that great relationship but you know one of the things BU is really wanting to do is that whole notion of it's a community and we want to have the whole community mentally healthy um, and Brooke I'm not sure if you've you've kind of gotten to that yet and maybe we will move on to the next slide because I think it is really you know really all the things we're talking about is how we can be more intentional more purposeful, more thoughtful about bringing that um, planning and thought to not only what's happening for children and young people, but what educators are doing with with families. Um, but it, but I'm thinking also perhaps with the school as well. So, Brooke, is there anything that you could talk about about you know if, if exploring a mentally healthy community with with children, what it might sound like, feel like, look like for for the children that you are working with? Yeah, look, um, our services, every decision I think we make, we're, we're consulting with the children. We can come up with something at a staff meeting and yes, it's quick and easy to make a decision on an educator level, um, but we go back to, okay, that needs to be um, discussed with the, with the children. We need to get their thoughts on it. Um, at afternoon tea time, for example, we have a daily announcement sheet. So we're informing the children at that point what activities have been uh, planned for the afternoon, but the question also is, is there anything else you would like to do this afternoon? So it's um, okay to go and get the tennis rackets out. It's okay to get the yoga mats out and do that. It's okay to get the um, some music playing or bug catching, whatever it is that the children want at the time. Um, we also have um, surveys that we'll ask the children throughout the year and bringing those results back to the children. Um, we also just revamp, or still in the process of revamping our bush space, which we have TP, it was originally our TP area, but now we've extended that. And all the structures that came from within that space now has been through consultation and children's choice. So we took photos of the mud kitchen, of the music station, things like that, and the children got to, to vote. And I think that's um, a good way of showing the families that, um, that the children's voices are heard. We also allow the children each year to um, select our chosen chari charities. Um, so there's ones that we will support every year, um, for example, Biggest Morning Tea. But last year, our children actually um, nominated BU because they'd heard us talking about that. Um, so we thought, oh, the message is getting through. It was only a small handful of children, but we were really, um, it was a real satisfying moment to think that the children had actually um, thought of that. Our service, um, we have up to about 19 staff and only six of them are permanent staff. So like all, oh, I could almost say all OSH services, um, all, all of those casual staff are uni staff and many of them actually have second jobs as well. Um, we've been very fortunate to have a, a small base of male staff and they've been, um, I don't want to sound that it's the male's job to run around and play cricket or soccer or whatever, but you can see those connections um, that the children love, particularly those older children as well. Um, yeah, but we've um, we've had to be very conscious um, 
that there's a broad range of um, experience and qualifications within our staff. So BU's been great because we've allowed them to access the online training um, and had conversations. So it builds up children, uh, staff members' confidence in um, discussions they can have with children and families. Often the casual staff will think that, oh no, it has to be a responsible person or a senior member of staff to be able to talk with children. Um, and that was actually identified at an action team meeting that we felt that we needed to, our, the staff needed to have their mentors guiding them into how they can approach staff. Because some parents, as you know, are very approachable, others are in a hurry and they don't want to hear anything, they're in and out of the door really quickly. Um, but I know I gave some staff some tips and said, look, I know it can be, you know, you've got to build up your confidence and courage and, and so forth, but at the same time, go and pick a, a family that you know is that family that says hello to the staff every afternoon and go off and talk about something positive. Have that as a goal every day to increase that, that you do that, because in that way then staff are building up their own confidence and their sense of belonging that they are not just a casual staff member whilst their employment is of a casual nature, um, that they share the responsibility with our permanent staff. Thanks, Brooke. I think, I think I'm really struck by every time I hear you talk, you know, how much you've just, and not just, but how much you've been able to integrate the BU elements into everything you do. Because if someone was listening to you talk, they might not actually think you're talking about anything other than a normal everyday, um, you know, school age care program, you know, all of those things you're talking about are things that people need to think about and explore every day. But I, and I think, it, I think you mentioned it before, Jeremy, you know, BU, what BU does is bring a focus and, and, a, and a link to the point, to the fact that you're doing this with an intention to support the mental health and wellbeing of the children in particular. Um, but also perhaps the families as well. And I know, Brooke, you, you've said, well, we haven't kind of gotten to that point yet where, where we're um, you know, fully being able to explore, it, explore that with families yet, and that might be one of your next steps. But I think you know, even people just becoming aware of it and more confident, so the educators are becoming more confident, helps with that in its initial sense. But it, it feels really integrated into everything you do, not another thing to do, but just part of everything you do. Yeah, definitely. It's um, like I said, a lot of those things were we were already doing and I haven't felt that um, we're very fortunate to have a supportive director and a management committee that have said, yep, we want to get behind this. Um, but all the initiatives that we've introduced have all been low cost um, and the workload is not just the action team, it's across the whole team and all it's really it hasn't been many new things in terms of staff we've implemented some um, staff recognition and appraisal things that we've brought in place um, but in terms of the children you know everyone's always updating their resources based on children's interests um, or requests that they're after um, so yeah it's certainly been just a way of going okay yep we already do this um, but how can we make it better or like Jeremy said that it's not just going, oh, we need to tick the BU box this week. So what are we going to do? We're going to run yoga or we're going to do meditation or whatever it is. Um, and I know when I talk to our, our BU consultant, often I'll go into those meetings and think, oh gosh, I haven't done much. We, well, we haven't done much since um, our last chat. And I start talking and all these things, um, Juanita will say to me, oh, this is, um, you could put that in your quality improvement plan or you've just achieved this outcome. And I'm busily taking notes because we actually do achieve more than what I think um, that we have. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't ask, we didn't talk about this, I think, don't think, but I, I've been thinking about it in preparation for this, um, for this webinar, you know, the links to, and you touched on it slightly there, the links to the quality improvement plan, like what you do for BU should feed directly into, you know, your quality improvement plan. And some people choose to have a separate um, action plan for doing BU and some people integrate it into their quality improvement plan and just fit it into um, particular areas. I think it also fits really strongly with my time, our place. And I think we had a quick conversation about, you know, the, the outcomes for children in terms of, um, nearly it sits with nearly all of them doesn't it you know in terms of children are effective communicators um children's well-being um remind me the other two we yeah children have a sense of social um 
strong sense of well-being and identity within the service. And and for me, um, you know, whenever our service has meetings, we've always got a minute taker. So anytime I'm having my consultation session with um, yeah with our consultant. After that, I take 15 minutes to write up my notes about what we discussed. So it's not just all in my head or in my diary. And we've just got a, BU, a folder at the service BU. So I just go and print that out and put in the folder as um, a record of what we've achieved and also obviously of evidence. So um, yeah, and BU like the QIP is not a document that you open and close. It's, it's an ongoing process that you can go back and reflect on, um, yeah. Yeah, I think Jeremy, do, do you want to add anything? I've just been thinking about, all, you know, you've alluded to some of the tools that we can use, you know, the, the process of doing BU is also kind of fits with that process too, doesn't it? You know, the plan do review kind of cycle too. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, really, you know, I think I touched on it briefly, but, it, you know, the BU process and, you know, how every service and school utilizes BU is going to be up to them, you know, and, yeah. you know, Brooke has some amazing examples of, you know, and it sounds like work that they were already thinking and, you know, and doing and sort of had already planned in sort of their strategic plan. But as I said, it sort of brings that focus, you know, around well-being and around mental health and around behaviour and all those different words that we sort of like to use to sort of, um, you know, make sense of that space that we're working in. Um, and it really just brings it to the forefront of our mind about why we do these things, you know, um, and why it's important. Um, so for even, you know, when I look at that question, sort of that mentally healthy communities and how it supports families and how it supports the program, I think, you know, bring it back to sort of educators as well. It's about, you know, the things we were talking about is that common language and, you know, that um, example that you were talking about before, Sarah, um, is, you know, a huge one. And thanks for bringing that up about schools and services that don't have that, you know, that don't have a really um, natural or close connection with a school or, you know, a school and a service don't, they're not sit situated within each other. Um, but just the, what difference it has is when that, that common language is used between both. And I think, um, you know, that's a really good example about, you know, if a school's implementing a program or a, you know, a, a specific program that uses, you know, different language around what is mental health and well-being and calls it different things. And then they go from that into a service, you know, into, you know, a, um, a school aged care service, you know, even before and after, and they call it something totally different. Of course, our children, our young people are going to be confused. And I think if we're all confused about what language to use, and I think I commonly pull myself up and be like, should I use that word or should I use a different word? Um, I think it's about bringing light to that. But as long as we have that basis and that understanding of, you know, as I said, why this is important and why we do this, um, it's going to have a, you know, a huge improvement about, you know, the ways that we do things and the things that we sort of prioritise in our in our services as well. Yeah. 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 That's that's really important, isn't it? And I think you know, and just to wrap this conversation up because we could probably keep talking about it for a long time. You know, I feel like there's some really strong connections to the work that, and we have said it a lot to the work you do. But I think also, I think also the other really important point for me too is you you need to choose what's right for you and what's doable for you. Um, and I remember right at the beginning when I had a first conversation with Brooke, I said, "So how do you find time, and how have you, you know, how do you resource this? Um, you know, surely you've got this massive big bucket of money, and you've got all." this additional time to do that and, and she said no that's actually not the case um, we've prioritized it at, but we're also doing what we can do and what's right for us um, and I think that's that's got to be true and that's the thing that's the beauty of the BU framework isn't it and the process is that you do what works for you in a place that work you know place and time that works for you and sometimes like Brooke said she doesn't even realize that's what she's doing it's just when she has that check-in opportunity and that with her consultant or you know there's lots of opportunities for checking in to see where you're up to and where you're going and getting that feedback and saying what well, looking back or at that reflective process well actually I am doing a lot of things that support children's mental health and well-being so I reckon we've been having lots of conversations and lots of chats. So it's probably time for everybody else to have a have a bit of a go. And I think you know what we what underpins all of this, and Brooks already touched on it a little bit as well, is how we 
think about supporting educators and we will get Brooke to describe some of the things that they've been doing a bit in a bit more detail in a sec but what we what we might do is launch the next poll so I know some people had a bit of trouble last time so hopefully you can join in with this poll and thinking about as an educator in a school age care setting how you view yourself and I know this has been quite topical over the last you know while when where you know there's been a very a bit of spotlight shone on to who we are and what we do and and how it's viewed but you know I think this is an important opportunity to acknowledge that we need to when when we're thinking about a mentally healthy community we have to think about our, ourselves as well so you might want to choose one of those or any that apply interested to see what the poll results look like. Yeah, I know. We have not shut it just yet because it gives people an opportunity to get onto the screen and, and actually make a click. And I can see that some people are um, responding in the um, in the chat as well. So, and as I said, you can choose more than one because I think sometimes you might fluctuate even in the, from moment to moment, you might feel like you're more than one of those things. So it's not just about how other people view you, but it's also the experience. Our work is really challenging and it's really hard hard, and, and it's important. I think, you know, Jeremy, you talked about the why. So knowing why we do our work is also, you know, important too. So we'll just keep it up for a little bit longer. It's, uh, some people are saying they're having trouble um, accessing. So if you can't access the poll online, um, feel free to write it in the um, in the chat function if you can find that. And in a minute, we will have a conversation, as I said, with. Um, so some people are saying they're having trouble um, making a selection. So just as I said, choose one or two or make a comment in the chat. The other thing you might want to do is go away and have this conversation in your back in your services. And as I said before, um, this will this webinar will be available later. So this could be an opportunity where you stop. Um, if you you know if you've got 15 minutes, you could stop and have a quick chat about what this looks like. Or um, Brooke, I know you've used um, you know you were talking about you have quite a lot of casual staff and, and you've used you've got some way of communicating. What did you say you set up a WhatsApp group or something? Yeah, we did. Um, last year we ran a survey in May, um, just a general staff survey, and we asked the same series of questions back in about November, December last year to have a look at, because um, the key issues were around communication, which is often the thing for out of school hours care, given that staff run in to start the shift at two and run out at six, um, and our service doesn't run vacation care either. So, um, you know, sometimes the 19 staff don't see each other over a week. So communication was an area that we needed to improve. And so we introduced a WhatsApp group. Um, and it's quite funny because we have, you know, the 20 year old up until the 65 year old. So everyone's communi preferred communication can be quite different. Um, but we felt that emails were getting lost, particularly for our uni staff because they're inundated with their uni work and so forth. So we introduced a, WhatsApp, WhatsApp um, group for our staff and that's used basically for uh, gentle reminders or upcoming events that we've got going and we've also implemented a staff um, member of the week award so it'll be sent out to say congratulations to and so and the happy birthday messages that go on there for all our staff as well um, so that's that's been a good thing that we've implemented to create a bit of a teamwork um, and ensuring that um, little quick things are going out to staff as well instead of you know lengthy emails thanks um, thanks book yeah um, yes yeah, thank you Maria for closing the poll so um, Apologies if you had a bit of trouble um, hooking into that. So let's have a look and see if you did have an opportunity. And I know lots of people were for were sharing their responses as well. Most people think it's important or see themselves as making a difference. And I think that's really true in terms of this conversation we're having. And also a professional educator with knowledge and skills, um, which is great that overwhelmingly you see yourself that way. And, and, I, and I did see a couple of comments saying that, you know, we might see ourselves that way, but perhaps we're not perceived in that way um, by others, perhaps families or, you know, uh, in, in a bigger context. But it's great that you see yourself that way. And I would like to acknowledge that as well. Thanks, Maria. We might um, 
move on. And I think that's, you know, that come, kind of feeds into that whole question about how BU can also support educator wellbeing. Because if we, as I said before, if we're going to have a mentally healthy community, it's really important that we focus on that mental health and wellbeing of, of everybody in the context. So, um, Brooke, you've talked about some of the things you do. Did you finish telling us about all the things you've done to support your educators? No, no, I've got a few more. Yep, go. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, as you said before, or I think Jeremy said, um, educators having good uh, understanding of wellbeing is important because what they information and support that they provide to the children. Um, when we've started our, uh, we had our action team and then from there we identified little things also from our survey results that, um, what could be done to create a greater teamwork within our service to felt not even just teamwork too, but also supporting staff as individuals. Um, so we reflected on, um, we created a, a wellness policy for the service. And along with that, at the end of last year, we created a wellness bag uh, for all our staff going into the Christmas period. I said it was like their Christmas survival kit. And we know that life at Christmas time can get challenging and overwhelming for everybody. Um, we've also made sure last year that we had termly wrap up meetings. So all the staff are invited to attend, often perhaps they can't get it because of other uni commitments. Um, but it's an opportunity where we all sit together and talk about what's happening in the service. We've, with our, um, in regards to staff awards, at, I, I know Sarah will have a laugh at this <laughs> when we chatted about it the other day, our action team, said, you know, well, how can we acknowledge the, the performance or the commitment of the staff? And we didn't want it to be a tokenistic thing um, that, you know, someone felt like, oh, no, Brooke hasn't never been nominated for an award. It's her turn. She needs to, we, to get one. Um, we also were conscious of the budget. So we came up with, I offered some suggestions, whether it would be a coffee voucher or a $20 Coles voucher, whatever it was. And the younger staff on my action team um, said to just be able to get the recognition through the WhatsApp would be wonderful and also a small, small prize. So we now have a chocolate box in our fridge. Um, we get them when they're half price at Woolies and there's everybody's favourite chocolate in there. And the, the male uh, staff member on the action team, he just said to me, oh, Brooke, look, I'd just love to have a Zupa Duper at the end of the day um, for an <laughs> award. So it surprised me because, um, I thought they would come up with more costly prizes, um, but obviously it wasn't about that, which was really lovely. It wasn't about the cost or the value of the award that they got. It was about being formally recognised within, um, across all the staff were made aware of it. So that's um, been a really positive thing for our staff. Um, we've also, given the, um, Oh, sorry, God, I lost my train of thought then. Um, we've also allocated mentors to all our all our staff and we reviewed our staff orientation um, process because we have a list of all the things they need to know and in childcare we know the policy fold is very thick and lots of things that they need to know. Um, and so we felt that the time between starting and getting that done, um, we should be meeting with the staff more regularly. So we've created a... Uh, a four weekly check-in. So one of our senior staff is allocated to that. If she's not there, another senior staff member complete it. But it's just to get some insight from them on um, areas that perhaps they would like more training or support in, what they're finding challenging. It's all, when you talk to new staff, it's always um, about behaviour management. So they've got to give us a scenario on a situation around behaviour management. And therefore there the um, mentor can provide some guidance or or praise to say, look, that's how I would have handled it as well, or no, maybe think of this next time. So we've looked at all those processes um, for staff, yeah, the appraisal system as well, not doing again this annual performance review that you feel like you have to do to tick that box, making it meaningful. All our staff now to need to set, um, they'll either have a num different number of reviews depending on their employment. So if they're casual, um, will differ to the permanent staff, but all staff have to create termly goals. Uh, one of the goals has to be of a professional nature and one has to be of a personal nature. Um, so that's really good. They might express their interest, for example, 
we lost someone off the BU team because she moved to a different area and another staff member said to her mentor, oh, I'd really like to be on the BU action team. Um, so we found that those conversations have been really valuable and created a better um, teamwork environment because before there never seemed to be enough time for that where well, we've now created the time for that. And the conversations don't need to go for half an hour. I think sometimes if you've got more time, um, you'll drag it out longer. But if you've said, right, we've got 15 minutes before we go home, let's just go into that room or go out to the veranda and have a quick chat. And so those check-ins are really important. And I know particularly with Corona um, virus, when our, all our casual staff were off, taking that time is time consuming, but taking that time to do those check-ins with the casuals was really well received. Um, and I know our families were reaching out to our service um, just to express their concern and worry, like how are the staff going? Are they gonna lose their jobs? What's this gonna happen? And for us to be able to show that or to explain to the families what actions we've put in place to support our staff um, was really real, well received by our families. That's great, but you know, I'm really struck by the fact that doing BU for you guys is is embedding it into all the systems that you're already doing. You talked about policy, you've talked about processes, and and the same is true for your staff and you know your staff wellbeing. Just um, as we're finishing up, Jeremy, do you want to add anything about what BU, the educator wellbeing focus for BU, and yeah, what I resources there are? Definitely. Um, I think my first reaction from that poll when we think about, you know, how do we view ourselves, awesome to see that everybody thinks, you know, everybody has that view that, you know, we do make a difference and we are professionals in this space. But I acknowledge looking at that, you know, we do feel totally different, you know, from day to day, time to time. Sometimes, you know, we do feel like a babysitter. Sometimes we do feel like, you know, when we're undervalued. And even that experience of, you know, and that comment about how we feel, how we're perceived as well. So we might be on top of our game, doing you know thinking we're doing you know such an amazing job and then we have one negative family or one negative comment or one even perceived negative comment that you know within ourselves we take in a negative sense um, because maybe mum and dad are rushed to pick them up so it is really important to think about how do we look after ourselves in lots of different ways and you know um, Brooke talked about so many examples that we can do specifically but just broadly within the BU framework there's so many resources and supports um, you know, whether it's just simple fact sheets and stuff that you can distribute out um, in your, your newsletter across your team, whether it's a full fact sheet in a PDF or just some hints and comments and things like that as well. Um, so even if you just get onto the BU website, I'm just aware of time, get onto the website, type in, you know, educator wellbeing or staff wellbeing into the search thing and you'll get a million, you know, million hits come through. So, you know, have a bit of a look through and have a bit of, a, you know, a gander through the resources because there's so much already. So. Yeah, that's great. Sarah, Thanks, Jeremy. Oh Sarah, yeah. Can I just, I just quickly, can I add something? Yeah. I, I just wanted to say to the services that um, um, celebrate what you do achieve. Um, we've mm. got a closed Facebook page and in the last six months, we've doubled our number of families on that. We've now introduced an app. Um, since that launch last week, we've had a slowing uh, uptake to that, which that's okay. And we'll see how that goes in the next few weeks to whether we continue with that or we survey our families and discover that email and Facebook page um, is the way to go for them. I'm a parent and I love all those apps and things that you can scroll through in your own time. Um, but what you see is might seem time consuming, but once you allocate it to a staff member, you'll find that, that yeah, those parents who perhaps see you perceive you as a babysitter change their attitude of what they their perspective of you and you do that through um, showcasing all the wonderful things you do whether it's through your newsletter or a facebook page um, displays yeah it's displays at the service we don't have bu posters all over the walls at our service um, but we are demonstrating and highlighting to our families and our staff on what we do um, we've got a kindness tree and then we've put that in the newsletter to explain to the families what that means. We've put it on Facebook page. Um, we've also got a BU box for when our children need that time away. Um, we've recognised that if a child's, whether it's because of behaviour or they've had that day, like Jeremy said, where it's like, I just need to go to Ocean, I need to chill out for five minutes. Our bo mm -hmm. BU box um, has just got little items in it that when we say that, you know, the time out theory, that why don't you take the BU box into a space where you feel happy? 
um, and sit on a bean bag and you tell me when you've had enough time with the BU box and we'll, we'll pop it away. So um, I just wanted to stress those things because um, I'm a parent too of a child in out of school hours care as well. And the lengthy, the lengthy newsletters you can get can get overwhelming as a parent. So really mm. utilise any um, yeah, communication tools that you have with your family to get them to learn a little bit more and um, see all the wonderful things that you're doing. Thank you, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. So we we uh, have come un amazingly quickly to the end and we've only got um, a really quick moment before we need to finish. Uh, Jeremy, have you got one quick takeaway? Really quickly, I think we discussed it in length, but you know, BU is made to be able to use and utilize how you want and how you need. But as Brooke said, and as Sarah, you know, you said, Sarah, we're already doing this work and it's about, you know, celebrating what we're doing really well, number one, and what we can, you know, what are some of the ways that we want to focus on it? And there's so many tools within BU to be able to do that. So that's my yeah. real quick takeaway. Thank you. And I'm not going to ask you, Brooke, because what I'm going to say to people is I really want to thank everybody for coming um, and for your time today and your contributions and let you know that we've got a Q&A panel. And I know there's some people who've got some questions for you about the kindness tree and about team meetings. So Jeremy mm. and Brooke are going to hang around. Thank, if you want, if you need to go, and I know some of you do, then thank you so much for joining us. We really look forward to seeing you again in, in a space. Um, and hopefully you see school age care as part of this and that you see yourself in this. And I think that's, you know, Brooke, I'm going to speak on your behalf. That would be Brooke's message is, yes, it is, is relevant for the school age care context. Um, so um, join us. You could join us in an early years learning community to have a conversation, a professional conversation. Join us online. Have a have a view of the website. Just really find some way to hook in. Our Facebook page is really great as well. So we really look forward to seeing you in whatever space, perhaps another webinar or our virtual conference that's coming up. So thank you very much for those of you who've joined. Special thanks to Jeremy and to Brooke. So um, if there was a crowd in the room, we'd be clapping loudly. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'll say goodbye to all of those who are have to leave now but if you wanted to stay on we're going to open it up a bit and you might be able to, you'll be able to ask Brooke and um, Jeremy some questions so we'll just move into that space now